Somebody once said that the journey of a thousand miles always begins with a single step. And I think that sounds great. You know, it's kind of like, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? But when you think about a journey of a thousand miles, starting with a single step, what if you don't know which direction? Or what if you don't know what that step looks like? Or even if you know the direction and you know the step, what if you're not sure where that road that you're on is headed? You see, I think that those questions and those feelings are feelings that a lot of people have when they think about what it's like to follow Jesus. They see it as a journey of a thousand miles, a journey for the rest of their life, but they're not sure what that journey looks like or which direction it's headed in or what that next step is. You know, sometimes I think following Jesus can seem like an overwhelming task for us. We don't know where to start. We don't know where to go. And we don't know how we're going to get there. And, you know, here's what I've come to, to understand and experience through conversations and getting to know people is since coming to the orchard, many of you who are watching this, attending in person, you've made a decision to follow Jesus. You have uh, through a silent prayer on Sunday, through a conversation after church, or maybe just a God moment during the week, you saw your need for a Savior, and you put your trust in Jesus. You cried out for the forgiveness of your sins and submitted to His rule over your life. And I'm pumped about that. That's why we're here at the orchard. We're here so that people can come to know Jesus as Savior. And the primary way that happens isn't necessarily by walking an aisle and praying a prayer on Sunday. It happens in all of those different ways, at your home, in conversations, in small group, whatever. That's why we do what we do. But because oftentimes those decisions happen outside of a conversation with myself or, or one of our pastors or staff, the question that you may have now is, well, what's next? What does that next step look like? You know, and honestly, the truth is you might have been following Jesus for decades and you're still asking that question. What's next? What's that next step? Maybe you've never really been clear on what the first steps of faith really are. Sometimes following Jesus can seem confusing and overwhelming, but today that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at where we start, or maybe in your case, where we restart. And that's going to be with baptism, that first step. As a matter of fact, I think baptism is the foundational act of obedience for followers of Jesus. And we're going to look at that together today, and I'm going to kind of hopefully lead you to that same conclusion, that baptism is that first step of our journey. It's the act of foundational obedience in a lifetime of following Jesus. So if you got your Bibles, go with me this morning to Romans chapter 6. We're going to look at Romans chapter 6, and we're just going to look at the, the first few verses here. Um, it's going to be, you know, a, a pretty straightforward passage, and we'll walk through it together. In Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1, we see Paul writes, he says, well, what should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Well, absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. It's five verses, but it's a dense passage, right? It's thick. It's got a lot there. Uh, so let's just start with kind of some context of where Paul is in his thought process in this massive theological treatise that is his letter to the Roman church. Uh, here in chapter 6, what well, we just started reading, Paul is starting a discussion about the Christian, the follower of Jesus, and their new relationship to sin, which is something that we all have in our life. And he asks a question in verse 1 when he says, what should we say should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? He asked a question. So we keep on sinning because we know that grace continues to abound. That question 
flows from a statement that he made at the end of chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 20, where he said, the law came along to multiply the trespass, but where sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more. Where sin increased, he goes on to say, grace increased all the more. And so when we understand that, that, that our sin is deeper than we've ever thought, but God's love, God's grace is further than we've ever thought. When we understand that, that God's grace goes beyond the boundaries of our sin, that we can never out his grace and forgiveness, then Paul says, well, we're going to have to wrestle with that question. Undoubtedly, as Paul preached the radical message of the gospel, as he stood on the unfathomable depths of God's grace, he was asked, well, since there's so much grace, should we just keep on sinning? Should we just keep on going? Why does sin matter if we're just going to be forgiven? Should we go on sinning that grace may increase? And his answer is emphatic there in verse 2. Absolutely not. Some translations say, God forbid. It is emphatic. And then he gives us in the rest of the chapter two reasons why, as followers of Jesus, we are not to continue in sin. Reason number one, he says, we are dead to sin. As followers of Jesus, we are dead to sin. And number two, now we are freed from sin. Before Jesus, we were slaves to sin. We couldn't help but sin. But now as believers in Jesus, we are freed from the penalty and the power of sin in our life. But it's that first part, the fact that we are dead to sin, that I want to focus on today. Because Paul uses our understanding of baptism to help connect that point, that we don't sin as followers of Jesus because we are dead to that sin. And so really to understand what Paul's going with here, we have to understand some important truths about baptism that he kind of embeds in these first five verses. Three important truths. The first one is this. Baptism, Paul would tell us, follows our faith in Jesus. I think we see that pretty clearly in verse two. Go back in verse two because Paul makes it clear. He says, How can we, how can we, followers of Jesus, who died to sin, still live in it? Again, that we, how can we who died to sin, that we speaks to those who have made a personal decision to repent of their sin and place their trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. That's why when we talk about baptism, we believe that the order of baptism is important. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by order of baptism? I mean that baptism occurs after salvation. It is for those who have professed their personal faith in Jesus. This is what we believe as a church. It's what I believe as a pastor. It's what we hold to doctrinally. We know that there are other denominations and groups who would baptize uh, infants, and they don't understand it this way. But I believe Paul's pretty clear that the order of baptism is important. The profession of salvation must come first, then baptism. The unseen reality of a new birth is to precede the symbolic nature of baptism. It's that symbolic nature, I think, that helps us understand this even further. Why? Because baptism is a visible picture of the unseen reality of our death to sin and our resurrection to new life in Jesus. That's what it is. Baptism is symbolic. It is a visible picture that we have died to sin because we've repented of our sin and trusted Jesus. We are now dead to sin and alive to Christ. That's what baptism pictures. And if there's no reality that that has happened, then the picture has no point. It's kind of like candles on a birthday cake. You know, we put kids' candles on a birthday cake every year when they celebrate. And if the kid turns 11, my youngest son's turned 11 in a few months, you'll put 11 candles on that cake. Why? Because those 11 candles are symbolic of how old he's turning. Now, let's just say we miscount. I'm distracted. We put 12 on there. That doesn't make him skip a year. 
He doesn't go to 12. Why? Because the candles don't hold power in themselves. They're just symbolic. But if the symbol doesn't match the reality, it serves no purpose. The same with baptism. If there is not the unseen reality of death to sin and new life in Christ, then the picture of baptism really doesn't mean anything. You just went swimming in church. In fact, let, let's talk about that a little more because that's the second thing I think that Paul lays out for us here uh, in this passage It is that baptism really does picture our union with Jesus. Look at what he says. Let's read verses three and four. He says, or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now notice he says baptized into Christ Jesus. All of us who were baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death. Now, this is important, right? Because it's not just the order of baptism that matters for this picture. It is the method of baptism that matters for this picture. For that picture of baptism, of death and resurrection to sin, for that picture to be complete, yes, there must be that unseen reality of new spiritual life in the person being baptized, but the way in which that person is baptized really fills out that picture. That's why we, as a church, myself as a pastor, we baptize by immersion, not by sprinkling or not by pouring, but by taking someone who has professed faith in Jesus fully under the water and bringing them back up. We baptize by immersion because it's a picture. And hear me, it's not a picture of our sins being washed away. I think that's something that I've heard often in this part of the world. And whether you uh, have seen baptisms by pouring, by sprinkling, or by dunking, we may say, we would say, oh, that baptism is a picture of our sins being washed away. I want to be baptized so my sins can be washed away. Number one, that's not what baptism does. Number two, that's not what baptism is a picture of. Baptism is not a picture of our sins being washed away. Our immersion under the water is a picture, but it's a picture of three things specifically. Number one, it's a picture of Jesus's physical death and resurrection. We baptize completely by immersion under the water because it is a picture of when Jesus physically died on the cross, was physically buried, and physically rose three days later. That's why Paul says there that when we're buried with him, we're buried by baptism into his death. We are giving that picture. Number two, it's not just a picture of Jesus's physical death and resurrection. It's a picture of our past spiritual death and resurrection. And that's what we've already talked about a little bit. When we trust Jesus as our Savior and repent of our sin, our sins are forgiven and we die to that sin. So we are united with the death of Christ for sin and our death to sin when we are buried under the water. And then we don't stay under the water. We are now raised to walk in a new way of life. It is a picture of of that unseen spiritual death and resurrection. But I think there's a third thing, even if it's kind of lesser than the first two, baptism is also a picture of our future physical death and resurrection. One day, unless Jesus comes back first, you and I are going to die. We are going to enter the grave, but because of Jesus and his resurrection, We are not going to stay there. We will be raised to life once again. And so that's what baptism is a picture of. It's not a picture of our sins being washed away. It's a picture of Jesus's physical death and resurrection, our past spiritual death and resurrection, and our future physical resurrection. But what I want to really focus on as we kind of wind down today is not just that baptism, you know, is... Uh, uh, is that picture, not just that baptism is important, that it follows faith, but baptism declares our obedience to Jesus. 
when we are baptized, that baptism shows that we are now in Christ dead to sin. And what Paul says, we're not just dead to sin, but we are raised so that we too may walk in newness, or better translation, a new way of life. I love that phrase there. We are raised so that, so that we may also, like Jesus, walk in a new way of life. This is the importance of our baptism. It is the physical, visible, tangible declaration that we have died to sin's penalty and to sin's power over us. So now we are free to live in obedience to Jesus. Sin does not control us anymore. We can follow him. Even beyond that, baptism is a command of Jesus. And it's the example of the New Testament church. Pastor Richard Dowsett, he's passed away now, but this is what he said writing on baptism. He said, no serious reader of the Bible can honestly pretend that baptism doesn't matter. It's mentioned more than 80 times in the New Testament. Jesus commanded the disciples to baptize all those who became Christians. In the New Testament, baptism was always administered to everyone who made a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus at the time of their conversion and not months or years later. See, baptism is that act of obedience. We are following Jesus because he commanded it, because the New Testament church set the example, when we trust Jesus, we, are, we get baptized. To say it as plainly as I can, to be saved and then choose to not be baptized is disobedience. Let me say it one more time. It's a big statement, but I believe it. To be saved and then choose to not be baptized is disobedience. I like what author Max Licato says. He said, baptism separates the tire kickers from the car buyers. It shows that we haven't just said something in passing that we didn't mean. We weren't just grabbing at a free, get out of of hell free monopoly card, but that we are following Jesus, that we are committing ourselves to him as our Lord. What does that mean? Does that mean that baptism saves us then? That when we get baptized, that's when we're saved? No, not at all. We are saved by grace through faith in the person and work of Jesus alone. That's how come a thief on a cross dying beside Jesus can cry out in faith, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And without ever touching a baptismal pool, Jesus looks at him and says, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Baptism doesn't save, faith does. Then some may ask, well, is baptism necessary for someone to be saved? Again, no. Look at the thief on the cross. But it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Again, the simple answer is no. The thief on the cross shows us once and for all, Baptism is not required for a person to be saved. But what are the reasons then that a believer would not choose to be baptized? I think there's a few. Number one, maybe they, like the thief on the cross, had no opportunity. Maybe that there was a moment in their life where they trusted Jesus and then a tragic accident took them into eternity before they had the chance to be baptized. Maybe it was something that happened on their deathbed. Maybe they just never had an opportunity. Does that make that person less saved? Absolutely not. What about another reason? Maybe they have just misunderstood baptism or even misunderstood salvation. They never understood the necessity of baptism, the the method for biblical baptism, the order of biblical baptism, and that misunderstanding kept them from ever being baptized after their salvation by immersion. Does that mean then that they don't go to heaven? Absolutely not. Their faith in Jesus gets them to heaven, not because of what they have or have not done, but because of what Jesus has done for them. 
And so their misunderstanding kept them from being baptized, but it doesn't keep them out of heaven. But what about the third, and in my opinion, in my experience, probably most prevalent reason that someone chooses not to be baptized? Well, it's just because they don't want to. They don't want to get up in front of people. They don't want to admit that they weren't saved when they were a child, that they just got saved. They choose to, well, it's not that big of a deal to me. See, that's where I have a problem. That's what raises a red flag in my mind and in my heart. How can we say that we have submitted to Jesus as Lord of our life and not be obedient to baptism? It just doesn't make sense. I think this is where Lakato's right. It separates the tire kickers from the car buyers. And so what I would say is this. If you believe that you have trusted Jesus as your Savior and you have not been baptized, then I would ask yourself, why? Have you never had an opportunity? Have you never understood the importance and necessity and method and order? Or did you just choose not to because you didn't want to? I would really ask, that you consider that question. Because here's what I want to do. If you're watching this when we're airing it live, Sunday morning, September the 8th, 9 a.m., I want to give you the opportunity and offer you the challenge to be baptized today if you have trusted Jesus as your Savior and never taken that step. We're going to be having a baptism on the Suwannee River this afternoon. And what I want you to do is reach out to us by clicking the Request Live Prayer button, by commenting on the link, by messaging us on Facebook, whatever you need to do, reach out to us. Let us know, hey, I need to be baptized. And we will get with you and talk with you, and if at all possible, make plans for you to be baptized this very day. If you're watching it later, and it's something you still need to do, a step you need to take, still reach out to us. Send us a DM. Let us follow up with you. Because this is too important to put off again. Why? Because baptism is the foundational act of obedience for the follower of Jesus. And I want us all to get this step right. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for the time today to look to your word. And I just pray that your spirit would take your word and convict us where we need to be obedient to you. And for those who are watching who have trusted you as Savior, but have never followed up since with believer's baptism. God, that they would make the choice to be obedient to you in that today, as soon as they can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.